Hello, and welcome to The Canadian Story, where we discuss what Canada is, what Canada could be, and what Canada should be. So Alex, uh, I'm especially interested today to talk to you about energy and the future of energy. You're, uh, you're somewhat of an expert on this topic, or becoming one at least, and i um, we recently had uh, Ben Woodfinden on here to talk about uh, more of the, you know, ethereal and political theory side of why we love Canada. But I, I mean, you, it's its so interesting. So many of the people that are joining us here are immigrants to Canada, but they, they are passionately in love with our country. Yeah. And I'd like to know, to start off with, the question I ask every uh, guest is, what, what do you love about Canada? I love, uh, in a dry sense, the upward mobility. Uh, in a very simple sense, I think Canada does a lot of things well, and I think the thing Canada does the best of every any country in the world is its integration of new Canadians, uh, its opportunity for them to find their ground uh, in their own communities, and to create that door for the next generation. And and you know my my parents are are not unique at all in that they sacrificed a lot to come here. They forego you know opportunities for their own career advancement so that myself, my sister, my brother uh, can achieve higher things. And I've and I've had those doors open for me. Both because of you know their investments in me and the you know public education system, our university system, and how people respond to us. You know, I, I talk to peers in Europe and America, and they have different degrees of experiences as a new arrival, uh, but all of them pale in comparison to the welcomingness of of experience here in this country. And and that for me is is the biggest thing to be proud of. And I like that we welcome people regardless of when they got here. Right, we're we're welcoming to all people. And uh, whether they've been here for a long time or they just arrived, your Canadian identity is not attached to history. It's Mm -hmm. attached to choice. I'd like to, yeah, absolutely. And I'd like to add two things there. Uh, I I think the first is that, you know, when Americans talk about their success in creating immigrants, they'll, you know, they'll pick a few high flyers and say, look at this billionaire investor or, or inventor. In Canada, we have a lot more pride in very low level, what we would might call just run of the mail, salt of the earth, communities like Cambridge, you know, I was driving by, we had, you know, there's a Southern Muslim uh, or Islamic community center and things like that, you know, and, and I don't know anyone there, but I'm confident those are people who own small businesses, restaurants, grocery stores, trucking companies and so forth. And they just contribute to the vibrancy of, of Cambridge and every other community across Canada. Um, and, and the second thing is that it doesn't force us to choose, you know, in America, especially you will, it, it, during tenser periods like this, folks are encouraged or in, in, in one way or another to minimize their foreign identity, you know, but, but in Canada, we don't have that. Um, partly because we're small. I mean, if you look at, you know, the, you know, FIFA or, or something, there's no can, team Canada to cheer for in the men's at least, obviously in the women's is a very different story. Um, so every Canadian all of a sudden reaches back to the roots, whether those roots are five years ago or 200 years yes, ago and they're cheering yes. for England or, or <laughs> well, we got to find a sports team, Russia. Right? <laughs> yes. Um, so it's just those little things I think is, is one of the many ways that we're special compared to some of the other countries and in integrating new Canadians. I love it. So why don't you introduce yourself uh, to the listeners and tell us a bit about what you do for your work and some of your personal passions. And then we'll uh, we'll go into, I think, what's the most exciting about this particular podcast is I think you have some pretty uh, well thought out visions mm-hmm. for what the Canada's energy future could well, that's be. That's a very generous description. Um, so uh, thank you. My name is uh, Alex Simakov. As, as we fented, I'm an immigrant to Canada. I came here in 2001 uh, from Russia originally. And uh, I went to McGill University. I've been involved with the Conservative Party of Canada for my entire adult life. Um, I worked for several elections, provincial, federal, and, and even municipal. Um, of the relevant highlights, I, I worked as a policy advisor on energy to Minister Greg Rickford, Ontario's current Minister of Energy, North Development, Mines, and Indigenous Affairs. Uh, and currently, I work as an associate with the Energy and Environment Practice at the Sussex Strategy Group. Uh, so I primarily focus on energy needs, um, especially on electricity generation and distribution. Uh, but we have a pretty broad range from industrial consumers who have very high energy purchases to um, uh, First Nations projects that are trying to get more integrated into our economic system and, uh, and energy system in particular. So we have a pretty broad range, and, and I, I, I'm quite privileged Unlike a lot of, I would say, uh, consultants in my field, I get to specialize in that one area, um, and I get to work on that full time. And I'm not jumping around between a healthcare file and an education file or a manufacturing file. And uh, we get to dig pretty deep, and, and we have a really strong team. Um, certainly, definitely one of the best in Canada on on the electricity side. And um, we're fortunate to work with some of the largest utilities like Toronto Hydro or, or Hydro One. We work with um, uh, generators like Northland Power. 
Uh, we work with uh, a lot of smaller startups, even like Peak Powers, you know, is, is, is a really exciting client and they do distribution. We have a hydrogen client, small modular reactor in the nuclear space. So pretty broad range. And you and I have had some of these conversations. And, yes, and well, I'm a fan. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of your perspective on these things. And uh, I think Canada has proven itself to be an energy arguably superpower. Mm -hmm. And especially if you consider our per capita production and things like that, probably have one of the best hydro systems in the world. But, but uh, you know, there's this, I don't know, maybe it's a mythos out there right now that Canada's falling behind on this. And I would like to encourage our listeners to, to hear what you have to say mm -hmm. about what the future of Canada economically from an energy perspective could be. And then maybe what you what direction you think we should take? Right, right. Um, and, and you hit the nail on the head. We are undergoing a very much a transition in the in the outlook of our energy sector. Um, over the past couple of decades, Canada has has benefited tremendously from our substantial uh, petroleum reserves. Uh, processing, extracting, and and exporting those has brought great wealth to all of our country, not just not just the parts of Alberta and Saskatchewan where it's localized, but that money is filtered in uh, through government spending and investment and and finance law and so forth, and it's helped. Uh, achieve a lot of the prosperity we, we're fortunate to have today. Um, and in the Conservative Party, this is obviously a very hot topic. We are the party of the oil sands uh, one way or another. And we are very passionately involved and invested in the future of the oil patch. And and I think there's a lot of animosity around things like foreign interference and and environmental uh, activists who are, who are adamantly against uh, oil and gas. And I think we have this debate as to whether, you know, our, our side as conservatives or, or pro oil and gas will say, you know, we have one of the cleaner and certainly human rights wise, certainly one of the most upstanding systems. We have uh, are constantly investing in, in having cleaner extraction and processing processes. And if you look at natural gas, especially as an opportunity to displace coal, you know, that's very important and so forth. And, and these are pretty well rehearsed talking points. For me, I'm a bit more. Uh, bearish, I, I would say, on, on the prospects for petroleum in general, uh, certainly not limited to Canada. I think that the clean energy, uh, whether renewables, hydrogen, uh, nuclear, uh, et cetera, are a lot more promising and a lot more imminent than than some skeptics believe. Um, so for that reason, I, I think we as a country need to think critically about transitioning from oil and sands. I don't think it's a question about a government supporting or not supporting oil and sands production at this point. The market doesn't care, right? And and you have we've discussed, you know, for example, stocks and um, yes, yeah. <laughs> some companies, uh, some oil sands producers have a lower marginal cost than others on the per barrel, but none of them match what we're getting in the Gulf. You know, none of no. them are matching what we're doing in Persia or Iraq, uh, Kuwait, and so forth, even Russia or what's happening in Dakota and the Dakotas with fracking as well. Right? Thank you, and and for me, that's really the death bell for 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 oil and gas. Historically, what's what's driven the oil sector any in any country isn't the sixty dollar barrel. It's it's that hope of getting that hundred dollar a barrel or you know one forty and that's when things are really going. And I remember visiting Calgary during some of those peak oil periods and oh, folks boom were town. we were just throwing lobsters at each other. <laughs> yeah. It was a it was a, a different world. Um, yep. Yep. And and you're right in that a lot of producers can be profitable at, at sixty a barrel, but that's that's not really the same thing. You know, and, and it's kind of following, I believe, a similar trajectory in unique ways to Coal is undergoing. Commodities do this, right? Is they they have they are, they're less fluid market wise, so they have their boom and bust cycles are more mm -hmm. intense. I find than perhaps financial and in financial instruments or things like that. They do have the boom and bust, but sometimes they do go into secular decline. Yes. There, there was a book on uh, cotton. I can't remember what it was, and, and they were talking about the cotton industries around Liverpool and Manchester and, and the wealth that that had generated for that part of England and and the empire, and uh, it, it follows their decline from this this era of absolute wealth and. They were documenting quotes from various insiders and investors and industrialists. Oh, this is a boom and bust cycle. We're in the we're in the, we're bus, in the bus cycle, cycle right, now, right now, and right. the bus cycle kind of kept going and going. And <laughs> they started pawning furniture. Right, you know, and they're to like, make oh, well, well. And there's something unique, and I say this as an Albertan about experiencing a mass influx of wealth mm -hmm. and then having that taken from you. It it does something to the psyche that I think not a lot of other economic activity does. Yeah, yeah. Losing a manufacturing sector, I can imagine would be maybe a similar feeling, but but I don't I don't think there's anything quite like the commodity boom bust and then like you said waiting for the next boom and maybe it's There's never almost comes. like a spiritual element to it as well, like we've been blessed with with this, you know, um resource as a country and and um there's this feeling of frustration that and and it's very valid in that for for a better part of a decade there's been activists who have 
tried to prevent pipeline expansion and so forth. And, and that's definitely a concern and we need to address that, um, you know, and, and hopefully we'll have, you know, things like Keystone XL has an opportunity now to, to be revived. Trans Mountain is humming Happening, away-ish, yeah. I guess, hopefully. I mean, COVID, it's harder to go protest, apparently. That, <laughs> I don't know. No, that's not true. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so so for me, for me, I think it's, I want to look at the positive instead. I don't want to fight for the next, you know, decade of her, you know, f- scraps of oil. Uh, I think we need to be focused on extracting that value as best we can. But I think we need to start doing, and, and this is what the oil sands majors are already doing, like Shell and so forth and Suncor. They're investing in alternative technologies. The skill set you have in the oil sands from both a capital experience and, and a labor experience has a wonderful synergy with a lot of the things we're going to need to transition to a, a fossil-free future, as, as everyone insists we need to do. And, and I want to reiterate one point that I think gets lost maybe only in conservative circles. I think it's actually <laughs> percolated everywhere else. This is no longer like a, a, a fight of like, you know, there's the pro oil sands or, or pro petroleum or versus the anti petroleum like the whole world has kind of moved beyond this people are basically at, like this is inevitable this We're is this is done way. the door yeah. is closed i mean you're looking at blackstone or or you know you're looking at the world's largest hedge funds and investment funds and china high finance has everyone in, yeah the door is closing on on you know um fossil fuels as a growth area and 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 you're right we, we are going to see continued demand growth um in in parts of south asia and east asia africa and so forth but that will that will be enough to suck up some surplus demand. But it, it gets back to the fracking. Anytime, you're not going to get to 140. You're never yeah, going to yeah. get back to it. You're never going to get back to 100. You know, if you, if we go past 80, I would be surprised. That's a pleasant. That'll be a very pleasant day. But uh, the point is, now we have one month time to commission. You know, several millions of barrels, effectively, of fracking throughout right. the states. <laughs> right. And yeah. we have a lot of countries like Russia, Argentina is looking at. They're it. looking to get all of Just that out. Get there. in on that, right? Uh, offshore Brazil has barely started. They have some insane volumes. Eventually, we're going to start tapping into the Arctic, uh, you know, underground reserves there. So it, it, there was a long-standing fear that we'd run out there of oil. There was peak oil. Like, that was opposite. kind of it's a peak demand now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like they were <laughs> very wrong. There was no peak oil. There's well, I don't know if oil. this was the same for you in university, but like that was a big thing when I was in university. People were like, "Oh, we're going to hit peak oil and civilization will collapse." No, no, I was, I was, it was, it was in this century for me. So we had like <laughs> there was more reserves had been found, and <laughs> right, I'm, few, right. I'm a few years younger, not right. much. I'm, true, I'm, I'm true. teasing. <laughs> I, you're right, right. I mean, yeah. and and that's what makes it difficult, and I think it builds the skepticism of these forecasts of like, oh, well, here's where the economy is going like we've been hearing these things from like the club of rome for decades of completely wrong completely inaccurate predictions that have never materialized like peak oil being a yes. great example and that does build a, a lot of skepticism i think of of people who are in this sector and who livelihoods depend on it right i, I think it yeah it's, it's really hard to convince i forget who said this but it's really hard to convince someone of something when their their income depends on it not yeah being true. The mortgage it's, payment yeah, depends exactly on it, right and then you know you have folks that are can be a bit pretentious in that argument of like, excuse me, oil is done. What are you even doing with a hard hat and a shovel? Like, go home. That's disgusting, right? It's just, it's, it's a very condescending attitude towards a lot of people who. Meanwhile, they fill up their tanks. Meanwhile, they know, fill up their and tanks. Warm and warm their homes. And, you know, you see the uh, acute examples of, of Extinction Rebellion having a diesel generator <laughs> on their feet, you know, and, and things like that. And, and we get lost in those weeds, but that's not important. No. What, what's I agree. important well, is. What is, the, what is the macro trend here? Where are we going? You, right. What, what's important here is that. We have an amazing skill set of engineers and and laborers, you know, in the most basic term, who are capable of reapplying their skills with pretty minimal training. We're not asking hard uh, roughnecks to go learn coding, right? We're asking them to pick up a different set of tools, and that could require some training. And there's a role for the state in that. But ultimately, what we are going to want to see is a couple of things: um, the emergence of solar and, and wind as cost competitive with natural gas is, is today. This isn't right. a this isn't a, oh it's coming any day now, guys. Like it's right now. I mean, an interesting story for me was in Texas, uh, a state senator there had proposed a tax on renewable wind sources or renewable solar sources to protect natural gas because the natural gas sector is saying. We're going to lose. We're going to start we, losing. We can't, we can't produce compete. to this level. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and he and and this is even at the extre- extremely low natural gas prices, right? So that's important to remember here. And I think this is the lowest up. we've ever seen them. I think. And I think it's going to stay like this yeah. for, for a while too. You're right. Um, it, they are around the world, and there's huge spreads, but we don't have to get into that between Asia and what they'll yeah, pay for natural right. gas. <laughs> the point being is is there is a nascent movement for forget a coal. Like coal is dead now. Natural gas is starting to fight for for its life. Uh, Which is funny because it was kind of projected as the salvation of these large projects, right? Yeah, as a transition fuel, but <laughs> that transition <laughs> might already be coming happened. to an end yeah. much quicker than we thought. Um, I remember looking at this space maybe, you know, five, ten years ago, and we had these waves where 
when oil got expensive, renewables became competitive because, well, compared to you know oil, it makes sense. Now we've had a year plus of of you know near record low oil prices, and renewables are like, we don't care. We, we there's we're not competing. We're gonna like, win. We're yeah. just a better technology. <laughs> like what people don't forget is an EV is an electric vehicle is the basic physics and the engineering of it mean it is inherently a better engine than an internal combustion engine. And a simpler engine. And a simpler engine. It requires less repair, it requires less parts, less maintenance. There's really no strong argument. Better acceleration. We can go on for better (laughs) braking. I mean, you know, it integrates with Braking that actually brings energy into your Uh, engine. Yes, you recharge right away. (laughs) You know, so so things like that are happening. And, And I think the first step, and this is all rhetorical and aspirational, but we need to stop fighting this rear guard action. The battle is over. We, we I feel sometimes like certain members of in our party and our movement are like those Japanese soldiers in the 1950s, you know, in South Pacific we, Islands. We, we must maintain. Oh, okay, yes, still yes, fighting for right. the emperor, right? Like a decade after World War II is over. Yeah. And, um, and I don't want us to be in that position, right? I, I, I think we need to look at people, not jobs, if that makes sense, right? The people of Alberta or the people of Saskatchewan and rural workers do have opportunities to create new growth. Uh, you know, solar and wind are, are very over, not overdone, but but well acknowledged. There, there's a lot of other things that uh, I want to touch on as well. One is uh, one is hydrogen. Um, I'm speaking this Thursday at the Hydrogen Business uh, Council that they're having a, a two day conference. I'm talking about the ways the government can can in Ontario can help incentivize that. Um, and and for for readers, I think they might have some background on that. Hydrogen is, is works really well in certain cases, but not in others. It doesn't necess- It's never going to beat EVs for private vehicles. It, it's just not as efficient. The, a big obstacle with hydrogen is it consumes electricity to create it, and then it consumes electricity to revert it back to electricity. Right. So if you could just do it with electricity, you're just going to do it yeah. with an EV. Right. Where it makes sense is a couple of unique places. Um, the biggest obstacle with EVs is charging. A lot of people don't want to wait 30 minutes to charge the no, vehicle. No, true. And there's going to be a lot of improvements in the efficiency and range of EVs, but there's a very there's a ceiling to how fast we can improve the charging rate. If you charge much faster than we currently, it's just going to explode. Right. They already <laughs> explode sometimes, right? We're trying to minimize the explosions. Hydrogen <laughs> is not that problem. Despite it exploding once in a while, it's, it's actually safer for mostly industrial commercial purposes we use it for. So instead of having to recharge, say, uh, an excellent example of where hydrogen makes the most sense is in uh, logistics and warehousing. So you can't use gas in a in a warehouse, obviously, right? No. You can't have any emissions. <laughs> so EVs and hydrogen are your options. If you have a f- fleet of forklifts, that means you need to pretty much take have two fleets. One is operating while the other one is charging. Right. Which is which is but that's wasteful. not tenable. Right. So you you can you can do hydrogen is a lot faster and obviously zero emissions. Same thing with underground mines. Uh, that's even better because you don't necessarily want to have to run cabling through every corner of your mine or, or underground operation. Uh, if you could just have a completely detached or you know wire-free uh, hydrogen underground uh, uh, powered uh, vehicle, long-haul trucking, I think, is especially where we're going to see in Canada the best opportunity for hydrogen. Um, it's the same question as if you're long haul trucking from you know Toronto to to Vancouver, you're not going to want to stop a couple of times to 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 tar- charge up. No, that, that's terrible. <laughs> so you, you're going to use hydrogen, and I think that's the best place where we can see the same jobs that people who are working on you know ice uh, or internal combustion engine uh, vehicles can work in hydrogen powered vehicles as well. That's not that's not a we're not being displacing them by programmers. You still really need a lot of people Tons of with mechanics, wrenches, mechanics yeah. there on site. Retrofitting the existing, uh, retrofitting our existing fleets, installing charging stations along the route, maintaining those, and so forth. Um, but one thing that I think green zealots or, or green activists are not very forthright is this impression that we can just cre- all, transition all these old economy, industrial, fossil fuel heavy jobs to new jobs. Right. Th- that's not true because at the end of the day, you really are not requiring the same labor demand for these new technologies we're discussing as you used to. That's because they're the simpler. They're simpler. They don't break down as often, right? The, the the fueling cycle is cheaper. You don't need as much logistics, et cetera, et cetera. But, and you don't need to mine a hydrogen. No, you don't need... <laughs> a machine does a lot of that work, right? right. I mean, a coal yeah. plant, you would have guys going down there with hard hats and shovel. With the with an electrolyzer, it's a, it would be a large facility, but machines do almost all the work. You'll yeah. have highly skilled engineers on site, but there's not a guy with a hard hat and a, and a pickaxe, as you might picture for, for your old-fashioned coal mine. So... We want to be mindful that not all of the people who are going to be who are losing out and are losing out right now in the from the quote unquote old industrial fossil fuel economy are going to just seamlessly transition. We have to accept that there are going to be some losses. 
the worst thing to do is to resist this transition and think we can save those jobs. Those jobs, in many cases, are, are tragically gone. Um, much like people lost jobs as uh, you know, riding horse horse drawn carriages, or uh, once upon you know, a time, you know, shoeing blacksmiths had a quite a booming shoe horse yeah, shoeing business, you know, or wh- whatever that thing was where they knocked on people's windows in factory towns to wake them up before alarm clocks. Right? Yeah. Tragic that we <laughs> lost that job. I don't know what it was called, but like you know, those people be- did other things, and and. So will the Canadians who who are being displaced, and that's what we have to be mindful of. Um, another thing, where, you know, that I'm very passionate about, and I know you are too, is small modular reactors. Yes, yes. After immigration, uh, Canada's second best comparative advantage is on nuclear. Um, many of your listeners, I think, would recall the Can Do program. It's well before our time, but still a myth, of, a thing of legend in Canadian circles, where Canada was a pioneer in civilian nuclear technology, and because of that, Ontario in particular has 92% emissions-free power. Yeah. The, the, you know, we have the second largest nuclear plant in the world in, in Bruce Power uh, on the Bruce Peninsula. Well, th- now it's the first, uh, the largest active in the world because Japan had had shuttered theirs. So we, we have the technology and you might have heard a lot about SMR in the past couple of months. And the reason it's really picking up traction now for, is a couple of things. The first is obviously we have this worldwide ambition with with uh, emissions-free power and, and that's great. But more in particular, we have... Um, we have these three main plants in, in Ontario. We have uh, Pickering, which is going to be closing fairly soon, and there's still some nuances in the timeline. <clears throat> we have Darlington, we have Bruce. Those are undergoing a refurbishment process to extend their lifespans and make sure they're safe and reliable and, and everything goes well there. That means we have about 12,000 of some of the most highly skilled nuclear engineers in the world right now in Ontario doing amazing work of the, of the highest tier of skills and, and qualifications. The worst shame, I think, for Ontario right now, or, or what would happen over the next 10 years, is if we don't find something else for them to do here. Because those folks aren't going out of work. They will just leave and be There's poached. There's lots of work for them There's in the world. There's no shortage of work. China and Russia, uh, Rosatom, are building nuclear assets at a, a very robust clip in, in developing nations. Obviously, the Western world is not following their trajectory right now, and I think that's a huge mistake. I think that... Um, I don't want to overemphasize the role of nuclear. I think some, a few too many conservatives do, and they make it seem like nuclear is a panacea to the world yeah, problems. This is, this is our silver bullet to it, solve the, the issue. Yeah, it, it Right now, it contributes about four, 5% of the world's energy consumption. I would love to see a future where we double in our lifetimes. Heck, let's triple it. You know, Maybe even quadruple it. That would be crazy. But we got to factor in two things. One, a lot of those assets are aging out. So we're naturally seeing a small decline in that. And and there's a limit to how much we can tolerate on the, on the conventional scale size of a Bruce Power or Darlington. It's hard to build. Yeah, and um, like the investment is insane. Right? It, it's too risky, right? That's why we haven't built one in our lifetime. Like since our parents' generation, yeah. they were the last ones to build them. So we need to uh, we need to start thinking more aggressively like, as we are on SMRs. We need to make sure those twelve thousand super talented people have a have some work to do in Ontario for the rest of their lives. For the rest of their lives, and their, and their children's kids, lives. Yeah, you know, you know, Durham College and, and a lot of our technical schools and so forth. They have programs that are creating kids right now with a skill set, and that's what we need, right? We, we, this government in particular in Ontario is very big on skills trains and, and and practical things. Let's let's make sure we foster that because you can't just code an, a nuclear plant. No. You need to have people <laughs> on the ground. We need to have... This is a very physical asset we're talking about. You, you get tired doing it, right? It's, <laughs> yeah. You're not even, you know, it's it's not even an auto mechanic or something. I, I don't want to describe, but it, it's incredibly labor-intensive work. And where I see a lot of opportunities for us is, is in two things. One is northern develop, uh, northern communities, and, and that's especially First Nations communities. Now, I do want to preface this that we're, we have a lot of work to do with First Nations to make sure that they have buy-in, consent, informed consent, etc. There, there is no shortcuts here, you know, more than anything else, because there's no point showing up and saying, hey, you have a diesel generator right now, it's poisoning your community, this is terrible, and we are making slow progress in Canada in this place, uh, taking them off of, of diesel generation, but we can't just plop down an, an SMR plant without any consultation no. and just force it in there. <laughs> No. Um, and that means we need to start training some of those communities in, in SMR technologies. We need to start having them have a financial stake in these technologies as well. Uh, and they need to grow with these technologies. The second one is is mining projects as well. Some of those are strong overlap, again, with the First Nations. And there'll be some projects, SMRs, that will power a First Nation and a mining plant. And, and that's great. Um, the active file is, is the displacement of, of our coal generation stations. So as, as you might know, Alberta has a few coal plants. Uh, New Brunswick has a few, Saskatchewan has a few. Those don't make sense just on the sheer economics. Even if we put a pin on climate change and that's bad, uh, the economics don't make sense. It's just more expensive to generate power from coal than it than it is from uh, nuclear. 
Ideally, like we, I can't say that for a fact. No. I can say it is cheaper for modern wind technology. Like mm. if you were to commission a wind plant now, and Alberta is doing that. Alberta has yes. commissioned some wind that is cheaper than the coal generation. So, uh, but yes, the designs and the cost estimates and the economics of existing technologies from Canada's leading small modular reactor developers strongly suggests and have been verified by the experts that we will be able to produce very low cost power, much lower than we're doing with coal. I'm hopeful we'll get there. The current timeline, we're looking at commercial deployment maybe around 2025, a serious role by 2027. I know that you know people get frustrated by these timelines, like I want it now. Um, but this is probably the last technology I'd want to rush. Yeah, it's ready. Like this yeah. isn't where we take shortcuts. No, you know? this is you have to make sure everything's perfect here. Uh, I I would like you to speak to because someone's brought this up to me before the fact that nuclear technology has been so siloed in that each country has kind of silo. There's there hasn't been any mass production mm-hmm. hardly. Can do being a maybe an exception to that to some degree, even though mass production is probably an exaggeration, but. Why do you think we haven't seen a an assembly line esque yeah uh, development good, of nuclear technology? It's a very good question, and I kind of have two answers for that. It's it's a Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. Um, <laughs> if you may recall, during the Cold War, people were pretty sensitive about nuclear weaponry. It's true, and, it's true, and its ability to you know wipe out all life on on the planet. Um, so that really got people really kind of focused on the security, yes, yes. safety, and and secrecy around um, nuclear technology. There, there was significant efforts to prevent proliferation. Um, only a handful of countries in the world have nuclear weapons, and that largely worked out okay. I, I'm of the opinion that nuclear tech, nuclear weaponry has has ushered in an era of unprecedented peace since World War II. And, uh, but we can put a pin on that. We can debate that later. I think we're on the same page. <laughs> so it, that's and but. It, we've seen to the present day countries like North Korea, especially uh, Iran, other countries that we would call rogue states um, that have sought to develop their own nuclear weaponry uh, for various reasons. And there is naturally a relationship between uh, civilian nuclear power and uh, weaponization of nuclear energy. Although interestingly enough, not in Canada. Not in Canada. Yes, we yeah. we we hosted some. Uh, to, to, yes, we were. We yeah. you know we um, had some silos. But and that's what SMRs are actually really cool for is that they are much more difficult to uh, to, to to weaponize. Uh, the the nuclear fuel that goes into them is is of it's a lower depleted, enrichment. Right? It's depleted. There and there's a variety of there's molten salt reactors. There's there are ceramic reactors. Uh, you, you know you should definitely get an engineer to dig into the deeper. I don't want to uh, misspeak right. here on the mechanics. But they are much more diff- much more difficult to to weaponize, and how it effectively works is you'd have a something the size of maybe a small school uh, or a couple of containers ships um, would be assembled on site or, or uh, built in a factory, shipped there, assembled on site, and the fuel would be securely transported. There wouldn't be any fuel work there. There we wouldn't, wouldn't be store any piles, fuel. Yeah, exactly that. Right. So it would be if someone were to raid. You know, an SMR station, they would, I don't know, get... They wouldn't. I, I, there's nothing they would be able to do with that resource. There would be no weaponization. You couldn't ship it out. And um, that's, a, that's, a, that's probably a question that people would have, so I'm glad you answered it. Yeah, well, you know, we, yeah. we, we, have, uh, we have some SMR clients and we, we have these conversations and they come up often, you know, what are the safety risks here? And um, Canada has a bit more work to do. Really, the whole world has to do with storing nuclear waste. Um, it's Nobody's really keen on having their community, no matter how... Um, sparsely populated to to be well, a host. You, you know my opinion on that. Yes, we can shoot them into space. <laughs> One day we will. And when you have a, a commercially viable transportation method to shoot our nuclear waste in space, I will be the first. You'll to be the first. In it. You'll, be, you'll be there. Yeah. Hopefully, you'll also go up twelve percent that day. <laughs> um, you know, and until then, we. It's actually not obscene or or unreasonable to continue storing nuclear waste the way we're doing, say, by near Bruce, right? right? We have, it's very safe, very secure. And and I get frustrated when we have green activists who are saying, oh, that's dangerous. It's going to, you're, you're replacing climate change with a whole new problem of nuclear waste. And I look at it and I say, well, every year by, depending on which measure you want to use, at least 10,000 people a year die from climate change. You could say a couple of million a year on the upper extreme, depending on what you want to loop into that. Nobody dies from nuclear, nuclear waste. waste. <laughs> that just, that doesn't happen, right? It, we have, Three disasters in the history of humankind. We have Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and um, Fukushima. 
pretty contained, uh, uh, all things considered. I mean, more people die from mining coal in China than they do from all those disasters combined. That's every year in China, right. more people die from mining coal. So if, it frustrates me when people yell, no, we don't have time. We need to act for climate change now. Nuclear is too dangerous. Like those aren't mutually what, compatible. I positions. always wonder what what is their end game? Is it? I, I there's this uh, theory, I guess, among maybe the more con, or conspiratorial people about the green road that they're just anti-human. And I and I, I sometimes get that vibe. They they don't they don't want any civilization at all. They there's a, a naturalist tendency to them. Uh, one thing I would. Yeah, you're not wrong. That that's a strain. That's a strain that exists, and that's a kind of extinction rebellion. There's communities that preach, you know, no children, right? So if yes. you shouldn't have a child, yes. but it is immoral to have a child. We had that scandal with a some bus, bus ad, yeah, bus in ads Vancouver. in BC. Yeah. There was two ads, anyways. Uh, but what I the don't want to do the gift you can give your child is not to have another. Yeah, that's, one, I think that's, yeah. that's grim. <laughs> um, we have a very broad range of, uh, on the left uh, or green activists, um, the progressives that. It's it's we have a tendency to to lump them together as kind of one batch, right? And there really is a very d- huge range of nuance from Michael Moore to Greta to Extinction Rebellion to David Suzuki. Some of them are aligned on various issues, some of them are not aligned, um, and they have more infighting than than I guess the right, so to speak, or, or more conservative Probably, forces. Yeah. So yeah, there there is a radical branch that it has a, a faith that civilization has been a mistake. Like we peaked ten thousand pre Ice Age was. Human that was people. that was when it was the best. Full yeah. equality, right? Nobody had wealth. Nobody had poverty. It was like you woke up that morning, you scavenged some berries, and if your objective is is equality, yeah, that's a, you know that's I would say internally sound. If you're, I don't know if it is. Like, what is your first principle if you believe that barbarism and the lack of civil like what is your first principle at that point is is just the natural no hierarchies order of things. Right, right. For, for these communities and and I'll admit like I read a lot of I read Jacobin Mag you know that's a communist that's a, a explicitly communist paper I read a lot of radical left um, material to get a sense of where they're coming from and what they want and and I think there is a growing appreciation for for nuclear as part of the energy solution um, and and I will be positive in that a lot more moderate people are shifting that direction you know uh, as far as First of all, you know our, our Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and, and Minister of Natural Resources Jamie O'Regan have both been supportive of of SMR technology and, and, and Jason Kenney and uh, Doug Ford. There yeah. seems to be a consensus now. Yeah, we we it, this was a process uh, a memorandum of understanding on SMR signed by uh, Doug Ford, uh, by Blaine Higgs and by Scott Moe of Saskatchewan and uh, Blaine Higgs of of New Brunswick, and uh, Jason Kenney signed on in August and. F- we haven't seen as much practical action from the federal government yet, but they have said nice things about it. And right. that for me is a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's that good, it's good when lot. the government right, is saying right. nice things, yes. Uh, it's, it's, it's important to have that alignment because you are not going to see this sector thrive in Canada if it becomes a political issue. No. Right? You, you can't have, nobody will invest the money you need to invest in SMRs in Canada if an investor worries that every four years you're going to have a different political alignment on nuclear is it good or bad that doesn't work so I mean, this is one of the oldest stories in i guess the lobbying slash political staff or world which is i think this is what all industries have been saying for a long time we just want certainty i think this is the big problem with things like c69 and and other attempts perhaps at appeasement of everyone is that you end up you end up creating a convoluted system that has no certainty yeah and I th- I think it's it's every political's fault to some extent because we we like to fight each other right, right. Like no one's like no one wakes up like I've joined this party and I'm gonna donate my time and money so I can agree with my political rivals no nobody does that, that. that's just <laughs> strange but it would be great if we did that more often well I, I, let's go into this whole idea of Canada idea of Canada's future I think like we need to get beyond this point of being enemies with one another. Mm-hmm. We're not enemies with one another. We're all Canadians. And while I may be, and, and yourself, conservative in our, let's say, our familial, like we, we have a familial attachment to these parties mm-hmm. at this point, not because of our parents, but because like this is our family. These are yep. our friends. These are, these are the people that we fought beside in election campaigns. The, this, these are the people that we have dedicated the democratic process to. This is like our team. Yeah. But just because it's your team doesn't mean that you can't agree. We have to. One of the one of the more, I guess, common theories, I don't think it's a radical theory anymore, is, is the idea that because of all the information, the accessibility to voters and the public, politicians have less opportunities to make deals. 
There was a time when politicians would kind of sit in a room and one guy says, well, this is my community's interest. The other guy says, well, this is my my industry's interest and so forth. And they hash something out that just kind of works. But it wouldn't be achievable on a piecemeal basis, right? And that's kind of the, the benefit of having large omnibus bills is maybe individually you can't pass that because you wouldn't necessarily get enough support for it. But if you tack on a completely unrelated measure, that also might not pass on its own. Together, they get through. One of the one of the topics that we talked about before was the idea of, of Canada's mi- mineral reserves and, yes. and, and yes. Uh, rare earth metal, metals and, and are just... Oh, I love endowment. this. Yeah, the, 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 the information here, folks, like this is <laughs> this is top-notch stuff. For, for uh, folks unfamiliar with this, um, there's... The, don't get too lost in the categories there. There's no standard for it, and that's part of the problem. A lot of or all of the modern age technologies we have, from smartphones to electric vehicles to wind turbines, require tremendous copious quantities of uh, what could be called rare earth metals. Uh, these are things like cobalt, lithium, and those are the two bigger ones. Then they range into much smaller ones like germanium and niobium and, and other names that I'm not going to try to recall all of them. And this is a challenging sector because they're called rare earth. Not that they're that rare. A lot of them are actually quite common. It's that if you're digging for iron ore, you could find a patch of earth where it's 5% iron ore. So you have to go through so much to get the right amount need, of iron. Yeah. However, with a niobium, it could be 0.01% of the mass you're extracting from the earth could be niobium. So you just need to consume a huge amount of mass. So I like your golf ball analogy. You want to Yeah, tell it's, it's something that? about it. I can't remember what, what exact element it was, but it was something you would have to melt down 50 SUVs to get one golf ball of a rare metal. Uh, and that's a problem, you know, maybe an average. And that's just what you have to do. That's just yeah. what you have to do. There's no shortcuts there. You can recycle things and that's another conversation. But what I wanted to add about the political alignment question is that Canada has a huge, huge wealth of, of minerals and metals that are absolutely essential for the uh, transition to a green economy. Right now, a lot of cobalt, cobalt especially for, for electric vehicles is, is critical and unavoidable, is mined, about half of it, I believe, or so forth, is in the Congo in just tremendously awful conditions. It, it's a war zone there. You have children, uh, slaves, murder. It's used to finance, you know, death squads and so forth. So absolutely horrendous, but we don't really have a lot of alternatives for it. So people are turning a blind eye and, and you know, we should call corporations to account, but the, the alternative question is, all right, fine. You don't want us extracting from the Congo, fair. Canada has some, can we extract it here? And all of a sudden you have those same activists. Whoa, 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 no, 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 no. That, that would ruin our environment. We don't want to extract it there. And I think Canada has to have a tough conversation about how much of the world's burden are we willing to carry in supporting the energy transition. One of the bigger things we can do is actually using our massive landmass, the second biggest country in the world, to have a way that is as environmentally sustainable as possible. We're never going to be great at it. You, you have to use many you know, thousands of liters of acid to bleach a chemical for a few pounds of it. Right. But those few pounds are essential to, to, to you know, decarbonize. And I, I think what we can do is is something. My my grand vision on this alignment is we align with the almost the liberals and NDP, the conservatives and the green all at once, and we we all get something that we want. Conservatives say, "Hey guys, we'll support the green energy transition in exchange. You allow us to mine all of these metals in Canada and allow our mining industry to really grow. Because if we're talking about rarer metals, none of them are really going to be extracted on C sixty nine. That's just there's no, no point of starting that conversation. No. Nobody's really proposing it. The other nuance I, I, I have to add is. Very few of these are effectively, uh, except for like lithium and cobalt, you can. Most of these smaller rare metals, you don't extract on their own. They're only a byproduct of a larger mining operation like copper or um, or, st- or uh, iron ore, uh, nickel, and so forth. And you get small amounts of that. Right now, China dominates that market. They have a monopoly on a lot of these because uh, they have no concern in this industry for environmental standards. Zero. They're just They just have huge swaths of... Um, particularly Western China, that is a, you know, environmentally scarred. It's 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 a it's a dead zone. There's life expectancy in like you know people in their 40s or 50s. <coughs> you folks are you know they might wear a mask. That's that's really right. it. like they're bleaching metal and acid, and, and they're wearing you know, a mask. They yeah. might wear a mask and some goggles, right? So Canada, there are technologies to do it cleaner, but that is expensive. It, the costs go up, and what China can do really well is whenever a a big competitor rises up, it floods the market with that product and it drives those miners out of business. They have massive stockpiles that we don't even have really good insight on. And it uses this to its geopolitical advantage. We saw in 2010, um, Japan and, and China had a dispute over disputed islands in, in the, between the two countries. And uh, Chinese thrallers, uh, fishermen entered waters that the Japanese claimed. And there was an exchange with the Coast Guard. So instead of having an actual fight, like we might 
in the in the old days, uh, China just arbitrarily decided it will no longer ex- export a a s- number of essential rare metals to the Japanese Japanese industries. So the very manufacturers. That's it. They they didn't actually say anything. They're like, oh, sorry, we're out. That was that was it. Like there was no. Oh, we don't have any. There was yeah. no big statement. It's not like because you did this with the ships and our fishermen. It's just like we don't have any. Sorry. And this created a crisis in the in the Japanese economy. They started scrambling through this very very opaque market to to you know create materials for the semiconductors, their magnets, and other essential inputs. And it was impossible, right? Because because it didn't exist. It didn't exist, or you couldn't get it anywhere, right? Everything is accounted for. And what happened was um, to China's advantage is that a lot of uh, Japanese industrials over the coming years actually migrated their operations to China to so that they would have reliable access. China said that even if you're a Japanese factory and your profits go back to, back to Japan, but if you set up your factory here, we'll guarantee... Because they just want jobs. They just want the jobs and the investment and the building of the factories and so forth. And Canada's an opportunity to do something like that. We're not going to be able to compete on the private sector just letting miners... Even if we go buck wild with the regulations and completely strip it down, we're never going to match China. Our labor costs are just higher... Our regulatory cost taxes are higher, et cetera. But what we can do is we can be a strategic supplier of a last resort. You know, we have a very strong Western alliance still of countries that are eager to secure their access to strategic metals, much like we did with uh, OPEC in the, um, well, I guess we, OPEC is a terrible example of this. <laughs> OPEC is a great example of, a, of an alliance of countries that brought the Western world almost to its knees by controlling this essential resource. Which China is doing. China is doing that right now. And Canada could be part of the solution along with other countries like Australia, which have also sizable mining reserves. America, again, is still massive even for its population. Uh, Brazil and so forth. Latin America is, is a strong resource base. Where we could develop our natural resources, especially rare earths, not on the market level, but as a military strategic consideration. As in, we will work with you know Japan, Korea, Taiwan and say, for this fixed price, we can assure you this amount of supply for this many years. We don't really do that because our market works pretty great. Like the world copper market or nickel market, right. you, you don't have to do that. It's just a waste, and it never goes well. It's it's uh, it, it really is government prevention. But well, they case, do do it with interestingly with uranium. They have the long term sales versus the the spot sales. Yes, right? yeah. But there's really no reason why anyone will have a spot uranium no. purchase. Like you you'd right. have to follow up on that guy. Yeah. Like you can <laughs> have a spot <laughs> copper purchase. There's any number of benign reasons. But if you're buying uranium just willy nilly, like we should check it on that yeah. guy. Like yeah. I don't know what's happening. We should, <laughs> someone should call him up. Um, but you know, if we're looking at some of these minor rare earth metals, we could have a a long term contract thing, and that would help. And the way we'd arrange out, it'll help bridge that political divide. You know, we have the NDP and the Greens not so keen on mining, but they are very keen on ensuring that we have a transition to green energy. Right? If we want to, and we need these for that transition, we absolutely need them. It's just it's not a oh, we'd be nice to have. Like you cannot develop a wind turbine without um, tungsten. Right? You, you, you need sizable amounts and so right. forth. Um, the interesting example, uh, there, there's a lot of good literature on this, is that during World War I, Britain continued, had blocked tr- export of some of the most obvious uh, rare earth, uh, not rare earths, some of the most obvious industrial metals to uh, Germany, like you couldn't ship ore or steel right, or right. copper. But things like tungsten, which Germany actually innovated ahead of Britain and became essential in their armaments, allowed them to use a lot less steel. We're still exporting them willy nilly. Like, there's not a consideration, right? right? There's, right. We don't have really good thinking on how countries use strategic resources to their advantage. I mean, uh, Stalin was was shipping oil to to Hitler the moment of Operation Barbarossa kicking off, right? Historically, Western powers in particular have not really, or any power has not really underappreciated the full capacity of essential metals or or other supplies in in their geopolitical alignment and i think canada can fulfill also our foreign policy goals and playing a bigger role there we're never going to lead by assembling a massive army nor do we no, want to no i, I don't it's not the canadian it's not, way it's not the canadian way but we can do some really creative stuff on the side and it also might create a bunch of jobs here too which would be pretty swell and <laughs> they can pay royalties and oh, and help pay for i love schools. it i it love like it a lot of things line up in my plan i i see no holes here i i feel like there is a this is a well-constructed idea no so um if uh, any of the listeners have questions about this, uh, I'll be sure to put your email in the. Uh, yeah, put my Twitter on there. I'll put your Twitter, Twitter and Twitter on there. I get people a lot of can emails. people can tweet. Um, on. Yeah, you do get a lot of emails. Yeah. Um, so to, just to conclude, I think I, what I get excited about what you're saying mm-hmm. is that there are real, tangible, practical 
and as we t- I talked about in a late or earlier po- podcast, c- practicality is a Canadian virtue. Mm-hmm. Uh, practical ways for Canada to transition out of this and become even better than we are now. Yeah, even more organized, even more helpful to the world. If I could have one thesis to conclude this, it would be absolutely to agree there. And and how I think governments can get there, both in the provincial and federal level, is. The federal government here is really keen on tinkering with the nitty gritty of handing some money to this company or that company. Startups of all scales, funding research and funding R and D is important. I, I don't want to diminish that in the slightest. We need to do more of that. How we can have actually a simpler solution for these problems is just to do central procurement. Say, I want to purchase this much hydrogen at this volume at this price, for example, for this period of time. Investors will line up. The reason that investors aren't lining up right now isn't because they can't get a hundred thousand dollar grant to like you know hire no, a couple of no. engineers. It's because Will somebody per- purchase my hydrogen if I make it here? And the consumers uh, on the consumption side also aren't buying it because they're like, well, why would I invest in a hydrogen fleet if I'm not sure my hydrogen is going to be produced? I need to know that production is going to be there. So a lot of these technologies, hydrogen, SMRs, and so forth, becomes a chicken or the egg problem. And we simply cannot lean back on saying free market, free market, free market. It's going to work out. Yeah, it will work out because China is building it right now. And then the free market will will destroy us. <laughs> buy that technology yeah, from China. Just, at a the free market will just pass us yeah, by. Exactly. All the jobs will be there. All the R&D will be there. And then we can purchase it from them. And that's the free market, right? We, we didn't have the free market when we built any of the other technologies we're talking about. And, and I think it's, it's a bit lazy to just say that's the solution. I think the challenge is finding out where is the right role for government at what stage in the technological evolution, at what level of funding, at what level of commitment, and what kind of risk does the government take on to break through some of these technologies and, and allow Canada to lead and succeed? Um, because it's it's I don't think it's the answer is subsidizing everything that moves. I don't think the answer is subsidizing nothing at all. Uh, there's something in the middle, and I think that's going to be the real challenge over the next couple of years, say maybe five, 10 years. Can Canada find that sweet spot? Um, and I think a lot of the you know, when we have this conversation in 20 years, I'm hoping to look back on that and be like, yes, we did. We, we figured it out. Because if we, if we didn't, we'll be speaking in Mandarin. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and my pronunciation is not great, uh, so it'll be tricky. It's a more complicated language. It is. There's a lot more characters. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you very much for joining us. I, I appreciate and, the invitation. Thank you. Uh, we'll be, I'm sure you'll be coming on again uh, in the future as we talk maybe about the Ring of Fire and what yes. Canada could do on that front. I would love to. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Canadian Story. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at The CAD Story. That's The C-A-D Story. If you enjoy this podcast, please share it with your friends and family. Let's work together to remind Canadians how great their country is.